Greetings, greetings, greetings to you all. Hallelujah. And welcome to Throwback Wednesday with me, Pastor Colin, and my darling wife, Pastor Maureen. Amen. Here is where we delve into our archives and really share some messages that are still relevant today. Praise the Lord. And today's teaching is no exception. Today's topic is by me, Pastor Colin, and it is called where is your allegiance the christians battle with the world now we want you to listen to this teaching uh it is an audio teaching it is an incredible teaching pray that it will in, uh, enrich you edify you and encourage you as you have a listen to this Well, we're going to just turn our Bibles over to the book of, uh, I believe, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And I'm going to be just sharing a word that the Lord had uh, put into my heart uh, a couple a day yesterday, actually. Um, I want us to really, um, really take heed to this because this is for all of us, amen. Whenever we preach the word or we teach the word, it's for all of us. It's not just for uh, the masses, but it's for those, even for myself, I receive what God is saying. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. 2 Corinthians 6, uh, verse 14 to 18. Verses 14 to 18. And it says, <coughs> Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion have light with darkness? And what concord have Christ with Belial? Or what part have he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement have the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Amen. This, this is a, an extraordinary passage of scripture. One of the things that I love about the Apostle Paul is that he spoke what God said. Remember last week we learned about speaking what God said so that we believe what God says and that we will see what God said. Amen. Well, today we're talking about where is your allegiance? Where is your allegiance? The Christians battle with the world. The Christians battle with the world. It's a very serious word indeed. But it's something for all of us to take heed to. Bless the Lord. I'm going to look at some definitions of some of the words that were mentioned in the scriptures so that we can understand where God is taking us. You know, the Bible says in verse 15 of 2 Corinthians uh, 6, it says, And what concord with Christ, uh, have Christ with Belial? Or what part have he that believeth with an infidel? Now, the word concord refers to agreement or partnership. 
So it's saying what partnership has Christ with Belial. So the word concord is either agreement or partnership. The word Belial means worthless, wicked, and it's also a name of Satan. So it refers to the devil himself. So it's saying what agreement or what partnership does Christ have with that which is worthless, with that which is wicked, namely Satan. There's no partnership, there's no agreement with them. And then the word believeth comes up. And the word believeth is the Greek word pistos, which means one who trusts in God's promises. One who is convinced that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. One who is convinced that Jesus is the Messiah and the author of salvation. That's the word believer, the Greek word pistos. Now this is an interesting word because when we go to the word infidel, when the word infidel is used, it is the Greek word aspistos. And this means unfaithful. It also means not to be trusted. It means perfidious, which is unfaithful, not to be trusted, unbelieving, incredulous, without trust in God. That's what an infidel is. So it's saying, if you look at infidel, you look at believer, you can see that infidel is the opposite of believing. Because an infidel is one who is unfaithful, is one who is unbelieving, is one who has no trust in God. That is an infidel. And that's what it's trying to tell you. You can't partner with somebody or walk along with somebody who does not have any trust in God. Who does not, uh, who is unfaithful, who is unbelieving. It serves you no purpose. And that's what the Bible is saying. So we recognize that the Bible is filled with clear directives of how we ought to direct our lives. And God clearly has our best interest at heart. Always remember that when you, when you read the scriptures, don't see it as a threat. Don't see it as something that God is trying to spoil your life or to spoil any enjoyment in your life. Because it really isn't like that. God has your best interest at heart. He has my best interest at heart. So when he says not to join together with something, he knows why he says it. When he says not to do certain things, he knows what is why, why he said it, because it could affect your life. It could affect the rest of your life. So God is not unreasonable in his demands of us. So when we read this same scripture now from the Amplified Bible, it gives us some of the definitions that we've used, but it gives us a clearer understanding of what the scripture is saying. And it says this, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, do not make mismated alliances, mismated alliances with them, or come under a different yoke with them, inconsistent with your faith. So be mindful of that. For what partnership have right living and right standing with God, with iniquity and lawlessness? How can you say that you are a person of faith and you are living right and standing with God and still operate in iniquity and lawlessness? It just doesn't work. Being around people who do not like God, do not love God, have a hatred for God, you know, they don't believe in God, doesn't help you as a Christian. It really doesn't. It serves no purpose. Okay? It says, what harmony can there be between Christ and Belial? And in brackets it says, the devil. We mentioned that. Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Well, we don't have anything in common. But that's the truth. That's what the scripture says. What agreement can there be between the temple of God and idols? There can't be any agreement because the Bible says, you shall have no other gods before me. And neither shall you serve them. That's what the Bible teaches us. For we are a temple of the living God. Even as God said, I will dwell in and with and among them, and will walk in and with and among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. 
So come out from among unbelievers and separate, sever yourselves from them, says the Lord, and touch not any unclean thing, then I will receive you kindly and treat you with favour. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord God Almighty. Now again, the scripture of detail. But the point what I'm making here, and the scripture is, is teaching us, is that we know that we are in the world, okay? But we are not of the world, as Jesus made that statement in John 17. So we know that we are in the world, but we are not of the world. Now, when the Bible speaks about separation, it doesn't say that you ignore people. It's not telling you not to have relationships with people, but you have to be mindful who you mix with. And you have to understand that if you are not strong in faith, you could be easily drawn into the way that these other people think. Yeah. That's why God says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What agreement or partnership can you have with the devil? You see what I'm saying? So, so in effect we are in the world and we love the people around us because God loves them. Yes. But we have to be careful who we mix with. Yes. Help us Lord. Help us Lord. You see the Apostle Paul, he admonished believers not to form binding relationships <laughs> with non-believers as this might weaken their Christian commitment. It might weaken their integrity. Mm -hmm it might weaken their standards. So you have to be a very firm and strong believer. If you say that you believe God, then that's the attitude that you need to have. So that when you're mixing with people, even if they try to, to, to get you to go amiss, to, to do anything out of order, you know that you have your faith to stand on and you know that actually, no, I don't agree with that. You know, and you move on. So God knows why he tells us the sense. And the reason why so many people have so many problems is because they mix with unbelievers mm -hmm. and they look for, to unbelievers for advice. Yes, indeed. For spiritual matters. Yeah, yeah. And that's not right. Mm -hmm. You're going through something, you can guarantee it's a spiritual issue. There are some things that go on in people's lives, it's more spiritual, it's not world, it's spiritual. And people try to deal with it with a, in a worldly way. But you know, we need to trust God. We need to be mindful that God is interested in our lives. And that's why he warns us about these things in scripture. Secondly, we notice also in earlier parts of the chapters that the Apostle Paul had explained that this did not mean isolating themselves from non-believers. Because some people go from one extreme to another. It's saying be mindful of the relationships that you develop with them. That's a, there is a difference. He urges believers to be active in their witness for Jesus Christ to non-believers. That's what he urges. But they should not lock themselves into personal or business relationships which could cause them to compromise their faith. Mm -hmm. And some people do that. And when things don't work out, who do they blame? They blame God. But God already warned us in the scripture who to have alliance with. Isn't that right? Help us Lord, all of us. We as Christians should at all costs avoid situations that would force us to divide our loyalties. Did you hear that? We as Christians should at all costs avoid situations that would force us to divide our loyalties. We, if we're Christians, let's be Christians. Yes. If we're men and women of God, let's be men and women of God. Amen. Amen. That's what the Bible is teaching us. So when we read the, the, the message now, the version of, uh, of the same scripture that we read earlier, I'm now going to read it from the message, and the message puts it this way. Don't become partners with those who reject God. That's powerful. How can you make a partnership out of right and wrong? That's not partnership, that's war. Is light best friends with God? Does Christ go strolling with the devil? Do trust and mistrust hold hands? Who would think of setting up pagan idols in God's temple? But that is exactly what we are. Each of us, a temple in whom God lives. God himself put it this way. 
I'll live in them, move into them, I'll be their God and they'll be my people. So leave the corruption and compromise, leave it for good, says God. That's quite detailed, isn't it? So sometimes the scripture is actually very well explained. It's how we want to understand it at the end of the day, isn't it? It's how we want to interpret it. So sometimes we want the word, we want to interpret the word the way that to, to fit around us and not for us to fit around it. But we need to be very careful. We are people of God. We are men and women of God. We are children of God. Hallelujah. And God has our best interests at heart, doesn't he? That's, what, that's why he gives us these warnings in the scriptures. So don't become partners with those who reject God. And then he ends in, in the message by saying, don't link, link up with those who will pollute you. Because sometimes people, we too, sometimes out of desperation and stuff going on in our own lives, we link up with people who pollute us and make us even worse. He says, I want you all for myself. I'll be a father to you. That's what God is saying. I'll be a father to you. You'll be sons and daughters to me. The word of the master God. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? It's wonderful to know that God really does care about us. It's wonderful to know that when he exhorts us in the scriptures, it's because he wants the best for us. When we were children growing up, we didn't like our parents telling us off. You know what I'm saying? If we were to be honest, all of us grew up in a, in a way that we didn't like what our parents had to say to us when they were trying to guide our lives, when they were trying to encourage us to go to school or to go to college or, or to go to work. You know, we weren't interested in a number of things. We just wanted to do what we wanted to do when we wanted to do it. So in effect, we thought that we were better than them. You know, they don't know anything, we know more. Yeah, we, we don't believe that they had the their experiences, you know, they're trying to guide us. Well, how, that's how many of us treat God. He's trying to guide us, he's trying to instruct us, he's trying to, to, to lead us and to inspire us. And we treat him with such disrespect. But he wants the best for us, just like we as parents want the best for our children. Just like our parents wanted the best for us. God wants the best for us as his people. Help us Father. And now we have another very strong passage of scripture taken from 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2 verses 15 to 17. 1 John chapter 2 verses 15 to 17. And I'm going to initial, I'm going to stop now reading from the King James. It says, Love not the world neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now, does that scripture make things very plain? Does not it? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Okay, we are exhorted to, to, to abide by what the word of God says. Because it says, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Why? Because it's a divided loyalty. You're either loyal to one or the other. That's why the Bible speaks about, if you are lukewarm, he will spew you out of his mouth. The word world, when used here, refers to the ungodly multitude. The whole mass of men that are alienated from God, and therefore hostile to the cause of Christ. The whole circle of earthly goods is to do with the world, its endowments, riches, advantages and pleasures, etc. Which although hollow and frail and fleeting, stir desire, seduce from God and are obstacles to the cause of Christ. In essence, if you focus on anything outside of God's will, that's an obstacle to the cause of Christ. You have been seduced. And many people are seduced by the things around them. Very much so. 
And so they go through life wanting this, wanting that, having a desire for this, having a hunger for that. But they are lying, they ain't God. As far as they're concerned, God ain't going to help me with this, I'm going to have to deal with this myself. But the Bible says, love not the world, love the things that are in the world. So the Amplified Bible then gives us an even more in-depth understanding of the scripture. And it says, do not love or cherish the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, craving for sexual gratification, and the lust of the eyes, greedy longings of the mind, and the pride of life, assurance in one's own resources or in the stability of earthly things, as we've spoken about, these do not come from the Father, but are from the world itself. And the world passes away and disappears, and with it the forbidden cravings, the passionate desires, the lust of it. But he who does the will of God and carries out his purposes in his life abides and remains forever. Imagine that. He that does the will of the Father abides and remains forever. So in essence, if you step outside of the Father's will, then you will not abide and remain with him forever because you've divided your loyalties. In essence, we need to do what the Father tells us. We need to do what God says. We need to follow God's instructions. That's the thing that we need to do. <coughs> Which is why Pastor Moyne and I always teach you to have your own relationship with God. So that you can know his voice. When you get into his word, you know exactly what he's saying to you, why he's saying it to you. And you put it into practice. Amen. Worldliness begins in the heart. It is characterized by these three things that were mentioned in the scriptures. First one is lust. Lust, preoccupation with gratifying physical desires. We always want to gratify self. That's what lust is. We can lust after things. We can have a, a craving so that we can be gratified by the flesh nature. And then secondly, you've got materialism. Materialism is craving and accumulating things. The fact remains is that you can't take those things with you when you go. Okay? And it's not that God does not want you to have things, but the Bible says that you cannot serve two masters. You either you will love one and hate the other, and so on. That's divided loyalties. But we must remain loyal to God, so that we can have all the things that we need, all our needs are supplied, all our needs are met, but we're in a healthy relationship with Daddy. Hallelujah. Isn't that beautiful? And for me, that's worth its weight in God. Hallelujah. And then we have, thirdly, pride. Pride is obsession for one's status or importance. You think that you're better than everybody else. In fact, you place yourself above God. Place yourself above God. That's a dangerous thing to do. But many people do it. They believe that they can do things better than God. God is moving too slow. He's not answering my prayer right now. And so therefore you take matters into your own hands. You believe that you're better than God, that you can do things better than God and quicker than God. Suddenly you realize that things ain't working out. And then the first person you blame is God. But God never tell you to go do that. So we need to be mindful of that. When the serpent tempted Eve in Genesis 3 and verse 6, he tempted her in all of those three areas. Lust, materialism and pride. She saw she desired it and she rose above anything that was told to her about what not to touch in the garden and she took and gave to Adam and Adam did exactly the same thing we also notice these three things happened when the devil tempted Jesus in the wilderness in Matthew 4 verses 1 to 11, we'll find that. The devil challenged Jesus. Jesus had been on 40 days, 40 nights of fasting and prayer. And the devil tempted Jesus in the book of Matthew, chapter 4 verses 1 to 11. 
and these three things is what he tempted with him with lust, materialism and pride but Jesus came back at him and said actually you know what man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God shall man live isn't that wonderful it is also possible like Jesus to love sinners spend time with them while maintaining the values of God's kingdom it's possible to do that yes. but we need to have Jesus with us it's not something that we can do on our own we need to be sure that we are sealed that we are confident in the God in whom we serve yes. if I'm having a conversation with somebody I cry out for the Holy Spirit Holy Spirit help me in this situation here help me in this conversation help me with this question help me to speak into this person's life that's how I speak to the Lord because otherwise you will end up saying the wrong thing in the wrong way and you will actually cause somebody to, 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 to end up in damnation so we need to be mindful of that we can be like Jesus we can love sinners we can spend time in their presence but we place value on kingdom principles Amen so therefore what values are important to you? that's the question that you need to ask yourself what values are important to you? do your actions reflect the world's values or God's values? so and that's the question I ask myself do the values that I have reflect what God says or do they reflect what the world says because I want to be liked or loved or you know I don't want to be seen as a spoil sport or spoiling somebody's fun and when you have that kind of mentality you will never please God but when you stand on the authority of God's word hallelujah the Holy Spirit will come through telling you comes through for you and makes you look strong healthy yes man it really does work so what values are important to you and do your actions reflect the world's values or God's values will you fall like Adam and Eve did or will you be victorious like Jesus was and those are questions that you need to ask yourself details look at what the message says in the same chapter of scripture that we just read this is the message version it said <coughs> don't love the world's ways don't love the world's goods love of the world squeezes out love for the father did you hear that love for the world squeezes out love for the father practically everything that goes on in the world wanting your own way wanting everything for yourself wanting to appear important has nothing to do with the father it just isolates you from him the world and all this wanting, wanting, wanting is on the way out. But whoever does what God wants is set for eternity. Isn't that beautiful? And how many of you know it's important to be set for eternity? Because there is a life beyond this life. That life is a life with God and Christ. Hallelujah. Seated in heavenly places. Isn't that beautiful? I have dreams about those things. Because for me, let's do the best we can do while we are here on this earth. And let's do it as unto the Lord. Amen. Let's do it the kingdom way. So that we are set for eternity. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. Glory be to God. So the question then is asked, what makes a thing worldly? What makes a thing worldly? Well, let's go back to the scripture that we read and look at the statement when it says these do not come from the Father that's what the scripture says anything that does not come from the Father is worldly because everything that comes from God hallelujah in the scriptures is to benefit us and set us up for eternity but anything that is worldly does not come from the Father hallelujah and that's the, that's the answer you exclude the Father from your thinking therefore you are worldly there's no middle ground you either love the world or you love God but when you love God he enables us to love everything without it being a, 
an issue for us, amen? And that's the thing that we need to remember. So we exclude God from our thinking, and when you do that, you are worthy no matter what you do. You make decisions and choices and make plans without the Father, you're worldly. You do not even take him into consideration. You are worldly. You don't even concern yourself with his will. That is worldliness. There's no middle ground. You either have loyalty to God or loyalty, loyalty to the world and the devil and all that, all that, that defense there. All of us are in this boat. So we need to start learning to be loyal to God. Because I'll tell you something, that's what's going to change your life. That's what's going to make a difference in your life. It may look innocent enough in itself, whatever we do, but when you exclude your Heavenly Father, it is of the world. If you are doing stuff and you exclude your Heavenly Father, it is of the world. It may look innocent enough, and people will go, ah, how sweet. But we have to be careful because we can be seduced very easily in that respect. So here is what the Living Bible says about the same scripture now. It says, stop loving this evil world and all that it offers you. For when you love these things, you show that you do not really love God. For all these worldly things, these evil desires, the craze for sex, the ambition to buy <coughs> everything that appeals to you, and the pride that comes from wealth and importance, these are not from God. They are from the evil world itself. And this world is fading away and these evil <coughs> forbidden things will go with it. But whoever keeps doing the will of God will live forever. Isn't that wonderful? <coughs> Hallelujah. <coughs> doing the will of God, you will live forever. Amen. So when we become like the world, we lose all our power and influence to the world. Yeah. And that's why many of us fall into so many traps. Sometimes we make bad choices and bad mistakes because we lost it for a moment. Because that only takes a moment, doesn't it, really? And we lost it for a moment. And then we have to shake ourselves and get back into, into the zone again, realizing that we stepped outside. Which is why repentance, where God forgives, is necessary. And when there's sincerity in the heart, God hears. Amen. <coughs> so when we become like the world, we lose all our power and influence to the world. James 4 and verse 4, again another very well detailed passage of scripture. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'm reading this from the Amplified Bible. It says, you, James 4 and verse 4, it says, you are like unfaithful wives having illicit affairs with the world and breaking your marriage vow to God. Do you not know that being the world's friend is being God's enemy? You see how clear that is? Do you not know that being the world's friend is being God's enemy? So whoever chooses to be a friend of the world takes his stand as an enemy of God. Now for me, when I read these things, I'm like, I'm jumping out of my boots now, you understand? Because, you know, we want to get it right, don't we? You know, we want, we want to be able to do what is pleasing in God's sight. So we really want to get this right. We do want to be set for eternity. Amen. Yeah, we want to be. So here is how the message puts it now. The message says this. You're cheating on God if all you want is your own way flirting with the world every chance you get, you end up enemies of God and His way. That's detailed, isn't it? That's what it says. You're cheating on God if all you want is your own way, flirting with the world every chance you get, you end up enemies of God and His way. That again made me think I'm like shaking myself and I'm thinking, no, we, we really have a lot to do to make sure that we get things right because we are battling with the world because we live in it but we bless the name of the Lord for his word to us Amen we must learn to be in the world but not of it we must learn to do that we live in it that doesn't mean that we can't live by kingdom principles that doesn't mean that we can't live by the standards that God sets out in his word just because we're in the world we're not of the world Hallelujah 
Come on. We are spirit beings. We just dwell in the body. Hallelujah. We have a soul and we dwell in the body. That's the way God created us. Let's look at John chapter 17. John 17 from verse 14 to 17. John 17 verse 14 to 17 says this. I have given them thy word, and the world have hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou should take them out of the world, but thou should keep them from the evil that is in the world. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And the word sanctify is to do with separation. So Jesus is saying, separate them from the world because your word is truth. Your word is greater than the world. Amen. Therefore, we need to be separated from the world because God's word is truth. Hallelujah. God's word is genuine and God wants us to be separate from the world. So even though we live in it, he wants us to operate by kingdom principles. We separate ourselves from the standards that the world sets and we do things God's way. Amen. So we must not be like the world. Amen. Here's how the Amplified Bible puts it. I have given and delivered to them your word, message. And the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, do not belong to the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you will take them out of the world, but that you will keep and protect them from the evil one. Praise God. They are not of the world, worldly belonging to the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them, purify, consecrate, separate them for yourselves. Make them holy by the truth. Your word is truth. Hallelujah. And sanctification literally just means separation. In essence, we don't do what they do. It doesn't separate us from them as a people, but by, from their actions. We may not love what people do, but we love the people. Hallelujah. And for me, we need to just get this right. We don't want to go to extremes. We are in the world. How, how else is the gospel going to get to the people? How else is the message of Christ's love going to get to the people if we decide to separate ourselves completely from those around us? What he's talking about is be careful where your loyalties lie. Don't have divided loyalties. Don't allow yourself to be compromised in any situation by a non-believer. Hold firm on your faith because eternity is, wait eternity is waiting for you. Bless the Lord. So we, number one, we are to be distinct and different. What are we to be? Distinct and different. All right. Praise the name of the Lord. Number two, we must not think like the world. What must we not do? Think like the world. Amen. We mustn't think like the world. Number three, our attitude is to be different. Number three is? Our attitude is different. Amen. And number four, our values must be different. Okay, what is number four? Our values must be different. And number five, we must be among the world. Number five? We must be among the world. But we're not of the world. But we must be among the world because that's where God has placed us. So we can share we can operate by kingdom principles, we can live by God's standards. In fact, we can live a very healthy life on this earth and people learn to respect you. In fact, people tend to respect you more for you standing on your faith than when you compromise your work. That's true. That's the truth. I've worked in many places where they wanted me to go here and they wanted me to go there and I've said no. And they, you know, they'd laugh and say, oh no, he doesn't, you know, you can come and mix with us, you can have a little tipple and all this. I'm not interested. But they learn to respect you. So then they don't ask you anymore. Because they know that I'm going to say no. So you have to stand on what you believe. And have faith in God's ability to take care of you. Yeah. That no matter how hard it may seem, you don't want, you know, not everybody's going to like you. Whatever you do, someone's always not going to like you. But God still loves me, and God still cares about me. So let's have God's interest at heart. Let's do things God's way. Amen. 
So when we are evaluating the standard of Christian behaviour, it must come directly from God's Word. Amen. It must come from His Word. Amen. And so we're going to read now Romans 12, verses 1 to 3. Romans 12, verses 1 to 3. Bless the name of the Lord. And then I'm going to come down. It says, I appeal to you therefore, brethren, and beg of you in view of all the mercies of God, to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all your members and faculties as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated, and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. I read from the Amplifier. Do not be conformed to this world, to this age, fashioned after and adapted to its external superficial customs, but be transformed, changed by the entire renewal of your mind by its new ideals and its attitudes, so that you may prove for yourselves what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God, even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you. For by grace, unmerited favour of God, given to me, I warn everyone among you not to estimate and think of himself more highly than he ought, not to have an exaggerated opinion of his own importance, but to rate his ability with sober judgment, each according to the degrees of faith appointed him by God. Hallelujah. And then the message puts it like this. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Isn't that beautiful? Everything. Place it before God as an offering. Isn't that lovely? Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. Where do you need to fix your attention on? You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what He wants from you and quickly respond to it unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. Isn't that beautiful? He says, I'm speaking to you out of a deep gratitude for all that God has given to me. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. He's saying, especially as I have responsibilities in relation to you. Living then, as every one of you does, in pure grace, it's important that you not misinterpret yourself as people who are bringing the goodness to God. No, God brings it all to you. Amen. Amen. The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what God does for us, not by what we are and what we do for Him. Oh my. Amen. And then, the Living Bible says this, And so, dear brothers, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. Let them be a living sacrifice, holy, the kind He can accept. When you think of it, think of what He has done for you, is this too much to ask? Don't copy the behaviour and customs of this world, and but be a new and different person with a fresh newness in all you do and think. Then you will learn from your own experience how His ways will really satisfy you. Isn't that beautiful? As God's messenger, I give each of you God's warning. Be honest in your estimate of yourselves, measuring your value by how much faith God has given to you. Amen. Every scripture that God gives us, hallelujah, is for our benefit. Amen? Always remember that. We're going to be in the world, we're going to have battles with those in the world, but we need to make sure that we are operating by kingdom principles. So the question that you need to ask yourself is where does your allegiance lie? Where does your allegiance lie? Are you loyal to God or loyal to the world? Amen. We need to be loyal to God. Amen. Let's stand. I just want to repeat this prayer after me. <coughs> oh Father, we give you praise. Hallelujah. Okay, just repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father I take my everyday life and place it before you as an offering. I choose not to copy, 
the behavior, customs, and attitudes of this world. I choose not to be fashioned after the world's superficial customs. Where I have allowed myself to conform to worldly customs and behavior, I ask for your forgiveness. Today, Lord God, I fix my attention on you. I adjust my thinking. I adjust my attitude. And bring them in line with your word. My mind is renewed. I come in line with what you say. I am in the world, but I'm not of the world. I choose to have behavior that is befitting for your kingdom. I have been changed inside out. Thank you, Lord, for bringing the best out of me. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the name of the Lord. It's good to pray and reflect and to hear what the Lord is saying. Amen. Amen.